Chris, thank you so much uh, for joining us nice and early uh, from your Melbourne home. So thank you very much for, uh, for being a guest on the show. Oh, thanks for the invite, Ben. It's great to be here. Yeah, I think we've got some really interesting topics to run through today. And um, I, I've recruited for your teams before. So I think uh, I've, I've kind of seen how you or what you like in, in, in certain consultants. And um, it's, it's been a topic we've discussed a number of times around what makes a consultant and, and a functional consultant and, and what that career looks like. So I really want to delve into that. Um, but before we go too deep on, on the specific role, I'd like to hear more about your background. Sure. Um, so what did you do before, before you found your way into this lovely ecosystem that we, uh, we all uh, work in? Yeah, well, I guess, yeah, I want to say I was pretty, pretty fortunate to end up working in the Salesforce ecosystem. It kind of happened by accident from my perspective. I'd heard of Salesforce, you know, prior to working on the platform. I didn't really know much about it. It was some sort of sales CRM tool that salespeople used, and, and that, was, that was kind of it. Uh, I studied uh, politics and, and IT at uni. Um, yeah, it found that I didn't really enjoy the IT part from a studying perspective, and so really focused on politics. But then at the end of my degree, uh, found that IT was a more appealing career and had been doing enough of it along the way. I, I was able to make that work. Uh, in the early days with um, kind of early software as a service web applications uh, around 2002, 2003, around the time Salesforce was founded, although um, you know, obviously Salesforce was pretty small at the time and, and very few people in Australia had heard about it. Uh, and ultimately ended up working in a business analyst role in the construction industry uh, at a company called Fulton Hogan. And they were right at the cusp of wanting to move away from kind of the, the many and varied spreadsheets and access databases that they had in their business. To, they used to manage everything from you know, progress within their construction projects um, to safety and quality uh, and environmental issues and that sort of thing um, onto a, a cloud-based platform. And they were considering two options. One was an Oracle product, which I don't believe is on the market anymore. Uh, and the other one was, was force.com. Uh, and so they went with, with Salesforce. And I was brought in to, to look up this platform for the Australian part of the business. Sure. Um, I, remember, I remember sitting there in, um, in a training session doing my force.com developer training, seeing you know, how easy it was to create things on the screen, thinking, oh, my God, this is amazing. Uh, well, where, where has this been all my life sort of thing? Um, it, it kind of blew my mind. So that your first, um, so you were going down the, the force.com development path at that point, like that was the, the initial kind of entry point. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't through um, through CRM or, or you know, sales or service. It was, yeah, you know, here's a platform that we can use to build custom apps. And in the time I was there, we would have built you know, 20 different applications on, on Salesforce. Wow, just completely custom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then um, going from that into to then forming a career in Salesforce and deciding that was your path, like what, what was that decision? How did that come about? And then what kind of roles have you played since then? Yeah, so I, was, I worked in that business analyst role uh, client side for about three or three and a half years uh, and then pivoted and moved into a service delivery management role uh, and stepped away from Salesforce. And I found I didn't really enjoy that at all. Uh, I, I realized that I enjoyed being involved with the technology, you know, creating solutions or helping create solutions. Uh, and so I, I made a deliberate move then when I left Fulton Hogan. Um, to go back into the Salesforce ecosystem, but also a deliberate move to go into consulting and join system partners. Uh, and that was really driven by wanting to be in an environment where I was amongst peers who shared that same passion for building you know, interesting, high-quality solutions. Sure. So um, you'd been a BA, then a service delivery manager. What was your entry point to consulting? Uh, well, it was I moved from the service delivery management role into into a senior BA role with with system partners uh, in 2014, uh, and really I was able to do that not off the back of my work as a, in service delivery management. It was off the back of my previous work in, in business systems analysis, yeah, and also the work I'd done on the Force.com platform. Uh, that's not to say I didn't have a, a substantial kind of knowledge gap, you know, as you'd appreciate. Uh, even in 2014, Salesforce was a lot more than just the Force.com platform. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to study up in, in a very short space of time, uh, but, but that was the move. Yeah, nice. So then what, what, um, what has kind of progressed from there, from a senior BA to where you are now, and what roles have you played? Yeah, so I guess the, the first logical, next logical step was moving it more to a, an architecture role. Uh, and being involved in not only the, the requirements analysis uh, and design for the Salesforce component of a solution, but looking at the end-to-end -end solution, including 
uh, you know, incumbent systems that the client has, any new systems they're bringing in alongside Salesforce, uh, and the integrations between them. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was a big step as well. Uh, having not really worked in a in a in a very hardcore technical space as far as integrations and that sort of thing go, uh, yeah, figuring out kind of the language, you know, of that world was, um, yeah, that was an interesting journey. Uh, beyond there, I guess I've started moving more into people leadership roles. Uh, initially, as a as a practice lead, looking after our, our uh, functional team in Victoria, uh, and then most recently into a, a national leadership role, looking after all of our functional consultants and solution architects across the country. Yeah, nice. And I just want to touch on one point you made there. So you were a senior BA, but I think like there are so many job titles that get used across the ecosystem now. And and you're, you've said that you went from a senior BA to a solution architect or an architect. Yeah. So were you doing consulting, not just um, requirements gathering, user stories, workshopping, but you were hands on with the platform at that point when you were a BA? Yeah, absolutely. And you've picked up on a really good point because lots of different job titles are thrown around, um, not only you know, between organizations, but often within some organizations. And you know, we we refer to our BAs now as functional consultants within system partners. And for that, for us, that really means you're a, you, you've got deep business systems analysis skills, but you also know how to functionally configure and, and set up the platform in Salesforce. And so I, I often use those two terms interchangeably. Um, but what's important to know is that when you when you start designing solutions that encompass more than just the Salesforce system uh, and start to look at the broader architecture, that that's kind of the the uh, you know the differentiation between someone who's a functional consultant, in my view, uh, and a solution architect. Um, but that's not to say that solution architects don't still do BA work in some situations. So uh, I think that the, the requirements analysis is a constant, no matter how senior you are uh, and how specialised you are in architecture or the Salesforce platform or otherwise. It's really about, I guess, the breadth of your responsibility within the solution. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting on the the whole um, like functional consultant BA because I think we see roles like systems analyst, business analyst, technical analyst, functional consultant. And and I have seen that there are some BAs in the market that don't do any configuration. Yeah, yeah, and they um, we come across them quite often re- recruiting, uh, and, and they struggle through our recruitment process a little bit uh, because we do need to test your Salesforce knowledge as a part of that recruiting process um, because we want to be able to deploy you onto a project and, and have you be kind of independent and productive straight away, both in analysing the requirements but coming up with the Salesforce components of the solution. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, it, it kind of always confuses me. If someone wants a career in Salesforce, why wouldn't you learn to configure? Because yeah, you know, you've got Trailhead there. Like it, the, there's no real excuse for not being able to 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 build a workflow or or like I, I can't say I can build flows, but I've definitely had to go a process builder and things like yeah. that. And and that's all been learnt from Trailhead. So um, yeah, it's kind of confusing why someone wouldn't pick up those tools if they're looking at a career in Salesforce. No, absolutely. And I think it helps in your requirements analysis as well. You know, being a commercial off the shelf product, Salesforce does things a certain way. And you're certainly going to have an easier time of it if you write your requirements, you know, uh, aware of how Salesforce does things. Sure. Um, you don't know, then put the people who are actually developing the solution and building uh, in an awkward spot where they're trying to, you know, create things in suboptimal ways that don't take advantage of the latest Salesforce features or, or standard features or, you know, the ways that the kind of Salesforce world works. Yeah, absolutely. So your team is made up of functional consultants and solution architects. So what, and obviously you're a consulting business, right? So a lot of your work is going in and, and implementing new, new, completely new greenfield projects or could be enhancements to an existing environment. But with a new project, what does, um, what does the role of a functional consultant and or a solution architect um, look like for your team? Yeah, so I guess I'll I'll answer it by talking about the different kind of phases of activities that, that, that you'll do on a project. And that's not to say these will always happen kind of in a waterfall sequence. Yeah, it might be a pretty agile project where they're all happening kind of within a sprint or within an increment. But but it's probably easiest to think about the different you know, phases or, or you know, types. That there are distinct design related activities. And when I talk about design, I really mean kind of design or requirements and design. Uh, and that you know, largely focuses around business process mapping, you know, both mapping the current state, um, you know, analyzing those pain points that exist in the current state and then mapping the target state or the 2B. Uh, once we've got the 2B processes locked down, it's then uh, about writing the user stories, you know, both the narrative, which is, you know, as a, I need to, so I can, but, but also the acceptance criteria. Yeah, and the acceptance criteria, if anything, are, are more important than the narrative because that actually describes the behavior of the system 
uh, that we need to we need to target and we need to hit. Uh, once we've got the acceptance criteria signed off, it's then the functional design of the user stories themselves. So to satisfy these uh, acceptance criteria scenarios, what actual components do I need to build in the system? It's these objects, these fields, you know, these process builders, uh, and so on. And then as a, a consultant becomes more senior, uh, uh, they'll, then they'll start working on the solution architecture components as well. And I say it gets more senior rather than saying becomes a solution architect because yeah, as a functional consultant or a senior functional consultant, you'll get exposed to these sorts of activities uh, and you'll often find solution architects delegating some responsibilities of that overall architecture to more junior members of their team. And that might be uh, you know, designing a cross-platform data model, articulating the key design decisions and the possible solutions with the pros and cons of those. Uh, it could be analysing some of the integration requirements, you know, large data volume considerations and so on. We then move on into the build phase where there's always requirements work still to be done, both revalidating or new requirements that the customer might introduce late in the piece that require some analysis. Uh, you're involved in configuration, unit and system testing, you know, presenting your solution and showcases. I would always encourage everyone to retest everything before they demo something at a showcase. Uh, you never know what might have been broken by something along the way since you last tested it. Uh, and then there's the documentation side of things throughout the build as well. You know, contributing to your solution design document, data dictionary, uh, and other as-built artifacts uh, that describe the solution that you've created for the customer that you're going to hand over, uh, and then contributing to the deployment plan. Then in, a, in any test phase of the project, uh, where there's no dedicated test team, you may be called upon to execute system integration testing test scripts. Um, you're supporting the customer during UAT, uh, and then you're triaging and responding to test case issues, wh whether they be defects or not. And that could be anything from you know, the, the requirement was misunderstood, um, they, they have a, a, an idea for, for new functionality that wasn't captured in the requirement, uh, which leads to a change test or in some situations defects as well. Um, you may be involved in training, uh, either train the trainer or end user training if there's no dedicated training or, or organisational change management function. Uh, and then in the final phases, which we would refer to as deployment and hypercare, uh, you uh, may execute the deployment via change sets uh, if that's the chosen deployment mechanism, uh, but you'll usually also be around to provide production uh, support you know, and do production verification testing as well. Uh, and if you're able to do all of those activities end to end, I mean, that seems to be the most satisfying experience, both from my perspective and with members of the team, uh, really seeing kind of from where to go and, and from your know, concept all the way through to delivery. Sure. Yeah, and and that last point, the whole deployment, that that's where I guess people end up working weekends and uh, and, and yeah. <laughs> the, the dreaded weekend work. Yeah, I I haven't had to do too many weekend deployments, but there have been a few interesting ones. Uh, getting up at odd hours on Saturday and Sunday mornings to help with testing and data migration and and so on and. Um, yeah, it can it can be an interesting experience. Sure. So a lot of a lot of what you've just said, and obviously some of it can be done away, and and you know you're you're um, you're working on configuration on your own at times or in a team, but a lot of getting things right is dependent on getting the right requirements. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, ha having the right user stories and and so on. So a lot of that is done like face to face, right? And um, yeah. so how what what impact has has COVID had on how your team performs their role? Yeah, so it's, well, everything's virtual now uh, for the most part. There are maybe one or two customers uh, that are still asking our team members to come into the office, but, you know, 99% of activities are, are over video conference. And that re represented some challenges for us, figuring out how to run a workshop and get people engaged uh, rather when, when you're not sitting in front of them. You know, this was, you know, requirements workshop was never an activity that we tried to do virtually you know, pre-COVID. And so we've been experimenting with different different tools to visualise the workshop content um, that we've been working on to keep it engaging. Uh, also with the agendas of our workshops to try to, uh, I guess, shorten the, the periods where people need to be focused because it's harder to keep people engaged in a virtual situation. Uh, also making sure that we're, where possible, we're able to have two of our consultants in every workshop as well. I mean, that was always something that was desirable previously, but I think it becomes more important now because you need someone driving the screen and then really someone you know, taking notes and capturing things that are going on to make sure that you don't miss anything. Uh, and I guess an, an extra amount of effort going into validating what you're capturing as well. 
really to make sure that you understand what's happening. Uh, and I'd, I'd liken it to, um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but at the end of the day these days, I often feel my, my throat's a little raspy because I've been putting so much emphasis into my, what, what I've been saying all day because it feels like we've got to try harder to communicate the tone or emotion or, or meaning of what we're talking about. Even though I can see you and we're having a conversation, I'm speaking louder and more deliberately than I would if we were sitting in a meeting room across each other from a table. And so there's just subtle differences like that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's I, I found that um, video is a bit draining as well. I think there's there's some press around this at the moment, but like if you're if you're spending a long time on video, it can can be more draining than standing up in front of someone on a, with a whiteboard, right? It's um, because you're trying to read everything, that, and it's yeah. not as easy to read. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You've got to be super switched on. Yeah, for sure. So um, aside from so product knowledge is obviously important, right? And and I think you, if you're interviewing someone, you're interviewing them for, for a variety of things, but product knowledge is going to be a key aspect of that because you need to be able to put them out in front of a client. But what what do you look for aside from from um, the ability to, to understand and, and use Salesforce to solve a problem? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess you, know, you might have picked up on this already from our conversation, but business systems analysis, yeah, capability, uh, it is 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 number one or number two, and and I say one or two because communication skills uh, is the other really important one. Um, yeah, and when we talk about those two things, yeah, they are they are the hardest things to learn. Yeah, much harder to learn than Salesforce knowledge. Yeah, there's so many tools out there these days. You know, to learn about Salesforce, but yeah, yeah, good BA skills and good communication skills. Yeah, some people might argue that, that they're not they're not taught. You either got them or you don't. I think that's not necessarily true. I think you, you get better at them through experience. Uh, in on the BA side, yeah, it's requirement solicitation. Yeah, identifying the root cause of requirements or goals or issues. Uh, really being able to probe deeply. A good technique is the five whys. Uh, to really probe into where something's coming from, producing high quality documentation, uh, and then being able to validate what you're being told rather than just being an order taker and accepting it uh, as a given. In terms of communication, it, it's uh, yeah, really workshop facilitation in the first instance. And, and what I mean by that is when you've got a, a, you know, a room or a group of people, it's being able to, to direct traffic within that conversation uh, and being able to stay on the agenda and get what you need out of it, you know, without offending anyone or rubbing people up the wrong way. Um, you've got to be able to manage objections, um, both in terms of people might not understand why you're probing into a particular area and you've got to kind of take them on the journey and convince them, you know, that it's important or you might be suggesting an idea that is initially, you know, objectionable to them and you've got to be able to, you know, convince them that it's the right way to go. Um, but also uh, communicating what's important in the process without coming across in a dogmatic fashion. Uh, is really important as well. And, and then, you know, finally on communication, being able to quickly adapt to the language of the industry that you're working in. Every industry has its own language. Uh, and and I, even still, when I go into a new industry for the first time, I notice myself make mistakes. You know, you, you're decoding what you're seeing and you, you think you understand what information connects to what and then you'll ask a question. You're like, oh, no, no, that's, that's not how that works at all. It's like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll bank that one and then move on and, and continue trying to figure out what's going on. Sure. Uh, one thing I've found over the years, and um, I guess this is true of any role or job title or, or, or person, I guess, but not all um, Salesforce functional consultants are created equal. Um, but but not just in the, you know, everyone has different levels of experience. But if you look at different consulting companies, a senior consultant in one business can interview with you and, and be a junior in your team, right? Yeah. So so what, what do you feel that the very best functional consultants do that mm. perhaps others don't? Yeah, so I guess yeah, I could talk about yeah, process and BA skills and that sort of thing, but I don't think that's actually the edge Yeah, because we've got you know, relatively junior consultants in our team that are really high-caliber people and have an ease and a calm about them uh, and a value that, that even more senior and experienced and more skilled you know, BAs and consultants may not necessarily bring to every situation. I think it, it comes down to two things. Uh, you know, really high quality consultants take people on the journey with them. You know, be they customer stakeholders or peers, they're about, about you know, bringing people with them rather than kind of you know, rubbing people up the wrong way. Um, but the other one, and it's less about style, I guess, and, and more about what, what they're interested in, is it's, it's contributing to the practice. You know, it's being engaged. You, know, you hear businesses talk a lot about staff engagement and, and how that 
translates into you know, high quality stuff or not. You know, we've got really great consultants in our team that will go and disappear into a project for six months uh, and then come back and they're like, oh, hi, you know, I'm back. I haven't spoken to you in six months. Uh, and then we've got other really good consultants who will go in and, and work on a project and, and, and bust their gut doing it, but they're involved in the team, you know, contributing to our methodology, they're attending team meetings, you know, they're sharing knowledge. Uh, and I think it's it, it's those two things, you know, that kind of, you know, set the, the really high performers apart from just the people who are, who are good on a project. Sure. And the, the role, um, like we, we are seeing now functional consultants popping up in end clients, and um, whether they're contractors or, um, but the role can, can, can differ. And again, it comes down to what people call themselves or what companies call yeah. people because an admin can be called a functional consultant. Sure. Um, but do you see lots of admins maybe thinking that they're a functional consultant? And if they're not, what, what's, what, what kind of is the difference between being an internal consultant and an external consultant? Yeah, so certainly we see a lot of admins pitching themselves as functional consultants in, in, in applying for roles with us. Um, but but I think you know the, the the key difference between working in an end user and, and working for us, kind of regardless of the actual responsibilities of the role itself, is is variety uh, and pressure. You know, um, there and I'll, I'll start maybe with pressure. I think working in consulting is a much higher pressure environment than working in you know, for an end customer. You know, we're, we're it's all project based, fixed budgets, tight time frames. You have to deliver. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that I really like about it because you're working in a high-performing team where everyone's coming to it with the same attitude and, and wants to be in that high-pressure, high-performance environment. Um, the, the other element is variety, and, and you know, I really felt this when I moved into consulting uh, when I'd been working in the construction industry you know, in IT for about 10 years is you, know, you think you know the world and your world is this big, but you move into consulting and you realise the world is this big and there's all this different flavors of IT that you had no idea even existed. Uh, and, and that's what uh, that's what I love about it as well. You know, it's, it's exciting, it's interesting, there's always something to learn, but that's hard as well. You know, you're stepping outside of your comfort zone, almost every customer uh, that you walk into, uh, and you, you've got to learn all these new things and, and get comfortable being uncomfortable to a degree. Sure. And pressure is, is definitely one thing, but pressure doesn't necessarily mean like bad work-life balance right or long hours because i think that's a common misconception is well um i i don't want to go into consulting because i'm gonna have to work nights and i'm gonna have to work weekends and i know i mentioned deployments at weekends but that happens in an end user environment as well sometimes so so yeah that that isn't necessarily the case right no no not at all yeah and I, i'd say if you're consistently working evenings and weekends over a prolonged period of time you're probably doing something wrong uh, or maybe you're holding yourself to too high a standard. Generally, you know, we certainly don't structure things in a way where, where that's going to need to be the case, and you're certainly not expected to. There are going to be kind of peaks, you know, where absolutely it's going to be required, and deployments are a good example of that. Um, there may be other situations where, you know, based on you know, what's going on at the time, to hit a deadline, uh, you may need to work the odd evening. You know, or, or very occasionally the weekend, but if it's it shouldn't happen all the time. Yeah, you know, you know, on the other hand, there are going to be times when you know, think things are, are pretty much under control. You know, you got a good handle on it, and and you're working pretty reasonable hours, um, potentially shorter hours than someone working for an end customer might be. Um, but but yeah, it, it varies. You sure, know, it's not going to be one or the other consistently. And so the million dollar question for, for someone without consulting experience who wants to get consulting experience, yeah. they often get told, oh, you don't have consulting experience. And it's a hard thing to, to gain if you obviously you don't have it. Right. So yeah. how do you demonstrate that you're ready to be a consultant if you haven't been a consultant before? Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, probably first and foremost, it's about attitude uh, and it's, a, it's a acknowledging that that's a weak area yeah, and demonstrating a willingness to learn and, and, and showing off what you are good at in terms of communication skills and, and that sort of thing. Um, but also, I think getting runs on the board in, in business analysis uh, and also with Salesforce knowledge is going to be the best foundation to get into consulting. Yeah, everyone who comes into consulting uh, yeah, has their first consulting role at some point, um, be it at a, at a, at a graduate level or, or after that. Um, but it, it's that BA and Salesforce knowledge that is foundational combined with communication skills that's going to allow you to make that transition. 
Nice. Okay, cool. So um, talking of transitions, uh, obviously getting Salesforce experience is, is important. Um, yeah. But I have seen that in the past, some of the the, the team that, that you work with both in Melbourne and, and Sydney, you've hired kind of industry specialists or maybe product specialists. So, you know, someone coming out of banking into a banking organization. How easy is that transition for someone? Yeah, it's a good one. So there's probably two different scenarios, or maybe three different scenarios I'll, I'll talk about. Yeah, we'll, we'll deal with the industry one first. So if someone's worked for an end user, uh, has deep industry knowledge and, and some knowledge of Salesforce, um, you know, along with some of those foundational skills like like requirements analysis and, and that sort of thing, you absolutely can make the transition. You know, they're going to need to, to upskill you know, uh, very quickly on the actual technology itself. Um, but but that, that's definitely doable. Um, the, the other scenario, that two scenarios are coming from a different technology stack. Uh, and, and one of those um, could, is relatively easy and one's pretty challenging. If you've been working in a CRM domain, so say Siebel, uh, and you've got you know, the foundational skills like your requirements analysis and that sort of thing, and you're really retooling on Salesforce, that then then you can be very successful. Again, you do have that knowledge gap you need to rapidly fill, um, but you're in in a similar domain previously. So conceptually, it's not that big a leap to move between the two. Uh, but if you were in a, in a non-CRM technology domain, say you're a solution architect working on you know, infrastructure solutions, setting up data centers or something like that, CRM is dramatically different. Uh, and so you, you, I think, well, the people I've seen really struggle um, to make that conceptual leap because, you know, concepts as basic as accounts and contacts, you know, or, or you know, leads and opportunities are, are completely foreign uh, in that environment. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen the same. And I think, um, you know, there are so many people now looking to transition into Salesforce. And there are there are absolutely some real success stories of people that have come from completely left field and, and you know, not, not IT backgrounds at yeah. all. Um, but landing straight into a functional consultant role would be very challenging, I think, if um, if that's the case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, particularly with a large consulting organisation. Yeah, I think that the larger the organisation you're targeting, the more uh, you know, the more rigid the requirements are going to be, and the less willing they're going to be to take a chance on a on a, a non traditional or unproven skill set. Sure. Um, and talking of, we 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 spoke about like not all consultants being um, equal. Um, do you think like between consulting companies, do, do you find that uh, if they've worked on big projects, they tend to um, to have you know better skills as a functional consultant, or like, does it come down to the size of the projects, the user base that they're working with, or like, what what kind of do you see in that space? Yeah, I think you, you are going to see a difference between people who have worked on enterprise scale projects and in enterprise environments versus people who haven't. And it's not that the people who haven't are necessarily bad at their job or or don't know what they're doing, but I think you're exposed to a different standard of doing things. You know, and if we talk about deployments as an example, um, you know, in, in a smaller non-enterprise environment, you know, it's pretty common to use change sets you know, as your deployment tool. Uh, and, and that introduces some limitations, particularly when it comes to, let's say, rolling back changes. You know, if, you, if your deployment you know, breaks something critically and, and you need to, to, to back out of it. Um, whereas in an enterprise environment, you know, you're very rarely going to use change sets. Um, there's always going to be a metadata-driven deployment tool. Um, you'll probably have very technical, you know, uh, specialized um, knowledge in people who are executing those deployments using code repositories uh, to manage your branching uh, and that sort of thing. And so it, it's a very different uh, level of sophistication. Yeah, another example might be how you manage testing. Uh, you know, in a, in a non-enterprise environment, you'll very rarely do automated testing. And I'm, I'm not saying we do it in, in every enterprise scale project, but there are certain attributes to how those projects are structured so that can facilitate automated testing or at least more robust testing practices. Um, you yeah, know, writing your user stories with behavior-driven development style acceptance criteria is an attribute of that. We've got this same scenario that the BAs are working on, that your test uh, automation test engineers are working on, and your business users have signed off on, um, that, that runs all the way through the project uh, and, and creates kind of a higher quality outcome. Sure. Um, how those artifacts are managed and the product is delivered. Sure. So um, uh, another, uh, if we look back at your your, your background, so 2014 working um, on a force.com project um, to today where there are so many different products in the Salesforce ecosystem and so many different clouds. And like, do you think now people should be looking to be a specialist in, in CPQ or um, 
ju- just doing sales cloud projects or yeah. mar- I think marketing clouds are a bit different, right? Because it's a, a slightly um, different skill set. But but yeah, do you think people now should be cross cloud or specialists? It, it's a hard one to answer. Um, and, and it's very similar to asking if people should should target being industry specialists as well rather than product specialists. And I guess it, it's really, it depends on what interests you. Um, what I would say though is I think if you try to spread yourself too thinly, um, you could end up being a bit of a jack of all trades, but a master of none. I would suggest people target a specific technology stack within the Salesforce ecosystem to prioritize first. You know, kind of drill down on that one, get a degree of competence and and and, uh, and you know, skills, I guess, but before moving and looking at the others. You know, and I think the two main options really that provide. Uh, relatively broad opportunities would be focusing on the core technologies, you know, sales service communities, and then all the related features and and, um, and clouds that sit on those core technologies, you know, all, all the marketing cloud stack and, and all the various products that sit under there. Certainly core is a bigger market than the marketing cloud, um, but, but one of the two is going to provide you the most opportunities. If you want to look outside of those two technology stacks and at things like, say, the analytics, cloud technologies and others, there are opportunities out there, but they're very niche, you know, and they're quite different to, um, you know, the, the, the conceptual you know, knowledge and, and the skills you're going to need on, on the other technology platforms. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, uh, your uh, progression in, in any role is important and you, your team is made up of functional consultants and solution architects. And I think it's interesting because architecture is such a, a big thing in Salesforce. Now everyone's striving to be an architect and, calling themselves an architect architect ahead of time and you know i think you know wanting to be a cta and and there's all these goals but how how can you identify if someone is ready to to take that leap from functional consultant to architect and how do they kind of get that responsibility yeah so i guess in terms of getting the responsibility it's about um doing doing uh you know little bits of the architecture over time you know under the guidance of someone uh, you know who's been in the role for a while and, and kind of learning the trade you know, the, the architecture document for a project, yeah, you know, it takes it, it takes a lot of work, you know. And so, a solution architect is, is more often than not going to be pretty willing to get some help from some of the functional consultants that are on a project as well. And so, it's about having a go at the bits that you you feel like you you're just ready to do, or, or you have enough knowledge to to have a crack at and getting feedback. Um, you know, working on, uh, yeah, you know, if there's a key design decision that is directly related to your functional area of the project and you're writing the user stories for it, putting your hand up and offering to do the first draft of that decision, articulating what the problem is, what the considerations are, what the, the several options are, the pros and cons of each, and then the recommendation is a really good start. Um, but but ultimately, you know, architecture is about uh, asking the right questions at the right time across the end-to-end solution and, and being able to design scalable um, robust solutions that include not only Salesforce but but all the other systems that you're interacting with, and so it's about getting exposure to those other items as well. Uh, and when you can when you can deliver that end-to-end architecture, you know, in your own right, or, or at least you know, give people the confidence that you can, that's probably the threshold. And I'm going to throw this one at you as a bit of a curveball because oh. again, it comes down to to the confusion between job uh, descriptions and roles, but. In my mind, there's solution architect, which is functional, technical architect, which is technical, but yeah. the CTA kind of confuses that a little bit because it kind of covers everything. Yeah. And we have people that are from a development background, real hardcore developers, coders, calling themselves solution architects now. Like in your head, what is the role of a solution architect in the Salesforce world? Yeah, so the, the solution architect owns the end-to-end solution. Uh, and has primary responsibility for making sure that the solution delivered satisfies the requirements of the customer and meets their goals. In our business, w- within those boundaries, there's then the role of a technical architect, which is a more specialised role, which owns the technical components of a project. So that that primarily is any customization that happens on, on Salesforce, uh, you know, anything written in Apex. Um, but it's also any integrations that exist and, and how those integrations actually function. And, and integrations are an interesting one. It, it, as an example, the solution architect is responsible for what the integration is achieving, you know, the data that's moving back and forth and that, that both systems are able to do what they need to do based on that integration. The technical architect is responsible for how the integration actually achieves that. You know, what's the integration pattern? What's the technology? Uh, is it using a middleware platform? You know, and so on. 
if you then look at CTA, that's wrapping all of that up into a single capability uh, and a proven capability based on the other past the review board. So it, that involves yeah, deep technical knowledge uh, along with an ability to own the end-to-end solution, uh, but also the ability to then communicate those ideas really effectively and concisely and in a super high pressure environment. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever sat in on any mock CTA review boards, but they are brutal. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've heard enough about them, but no, yeah. I've not had the uh, pleasure to. I wouldn't have a clue what was going on, to be honest, if I was sat in there. I'd, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it would be interesting to do that. But I think you summarised that really well, and I think there there doesn't need to be all of this confusion around um, you know what people call themselves. I think it could be so much easier just to yeah. to really clearly define the roles and just scrap the, the 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 stuff that kind of doesn't doesn't need to be to be out there. Yeah, um, I think so. I mean, I think. Yeah, the, the different roles being called different things in different organisations, yeah, adds to the confusion as well. What, what I've observed actually in a lot of government customers that we work at is they'll often call someone a solution architect and, and it's both of those things that I talked about. It's both the, the consulting solution architect and the technical architect in a single role. And I think when you come out of a more of a traditional IT background, that those two things ha- have more often been unified but for some reason the way the Salesforce ecosystem has evolved we've had these two streams of skill sets that both lead to architecture what we've ended up with um with these two different roles yeah so I know that there's a lack of um of, of amazing functional consultants like there, there just aren't enough to to fulfill all of the the functional requirements in the market and I think whenever I'm asked to find a functional consultant it's it's tough because um yeah. You know that the, there's so much that goes into the role. So I'm I would like to encourage more admins to to con, like to to get the skills that they require to be a functional consultant and to upskill around not just being on trailhead and not just um, the the platform and the technology, but the the soft skills and the all of the stuff you've discussed today. So if um, if an admin is listening or watching this, and and um, you could give them one piece of advice around you know taking that next step and. And, and broadening their skill set, what would what would that be? Yeah, so I would say, yeah, aside from practicing your comms and your BA skills and, and all that good stuff that is going to be really important, if you want to take the first step, join a small Salesforce partner. Uh, they are uh, that they're going to be uh, an opportunity uh, in so much as yeah, they're more they're more open, you know, to taking people who, who don't come from that maybe traditional backgrounds or don't already have runs on the board. Um, they're going to probably be doing smaller. You know, less complex projects so that it'll be a more forgiving environment um, to pick up skills and get experience uh, and then go from there. Uh, I think um, you know, when I first joined System Partners, we had 20 staff and now our practice is about 150 or 160 people. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm not, it, you, you don't necessarily need to join a partner that's that big. You know, there's plenty out there with half a dozen staff that would be a great place to learn. Uh, and it's, it's about getting runs on the board you know, and, and experience. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But there's there's one thing I always tell people, and that's like make sure there's someone to learn from in that organization. Because oh, I've seen examples of some of the smaller partners hiring someone and then putting them out on a project on their own. And and they've like I, I know one example in Sydney where a guy had never worked in a in a practical Salesforce environment before and he was put out on a project on day one. So so it's great to get that opportunity, but you need someone that you can ask questions and, and bounce ideas off of. Yeah, I, I agree. And in fact, I'd say that's great advice for life in general, rather than just um, building a Salesforce career. You know, go somewhere where there are good mentors that you can learn from. Um, yeah, one of the things that, that I often hear when I interview people who have come from a smaller partner is they'll say, yeah, how many projects will I have to work on at once? And I usually say, well, one, you know, because it's, it's going to go for several months and you'll be part of a team and, and this is how it works. And, and they've come from an environment where they've had to manage four or five different clients and projects concurrently. And so I'm not saying that small partners are perfect. You know, large partners certainly are perfect. You know, we've got plenty of problems, probably a um, yeah, topic for a different podcast. <laughs> but, um, but, 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 you still go to a small partner where they've got a good founder who has skills, has worked in a consulting environment before. If they're a CTA or an experienced architect, even better. Um, make sure that they're going to be available for you to ask questions. They may still put you on a project out by yourself. Sometimes that's going to be unavoidable, but you need a channel to be able to learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if anyone's listening or watching and they'd like to reach out and ask some further questions, where's the best place for them to, to contact you? Yeah, probably on LinkedIn uh, would be the easiest place. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm easily searchable and findable there, or maybe you'll, you'll share my contact details yeah. at the end. But yeah, re- request to add me and send me a message, and I'm happy to have a chat. 
Absolutely. Well, look, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. I think there's a huge amount of value in there for anyone progressing down that functional career path. And uh, yeah, really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Thanks for the invite. Thank you.